And I think that that is such a beautiful guiding light for anyone who's thinking about publishing their book. Because if you think about your story, there is inevitably at least one person whose life could be transformed as a result of hearing your story. And if that's all you need to do is just write for that one person, then you know, the more power to you because someone needs to hear what you have to say. Grain Rainbows, the podcast community for people coming out LGBT plus later in life. I'm your host, Dr. Ginger Campbell, and my hope is that wherever you are on your journey, this podcast will help you feel less alone. For more episodes of Grain Rainbows, along with detailed show notes, please visit my website at grainrainbows.com. You can also get show notes automatically each month if you sign up for the free newsletter on the website. You can send me feedback at grainrainbows at gmail.com. You can post voice feedback at speakpipe.com forward slash grain rainbows or post to the Grain Rainbows fan page on Facebook. We also have a private group for Grain Rainbows on MeWe, which I'll tell you about later. A new episode of Grain Rainbows is scheduled for release on the first Friday of August. But this is an extra episode featuring my friend Jen T. Grace from Publisher Purpose Press. Jen is going to share a little of her story and tell us about how Publisher Purpose Press helps people bring their stories to the world. She's also going to tell us a little bit about the memoir she just published, which is called House on Fire, Finding Resilience, Hope, and Purpose in the Ashes. If you have ever wanted to write a book, you won't want to miss this episode. But even if writing doesn't interest you, I know you will enjoy getting to know Jen T. Grace. Well, Jen Grace, it is great to have you on Grain Rainbows today. Thank you, Ginger. I'm excited to be having this conversation. So what I usually like to do is start by asking my guests to just share their story in whatever way feels comfortable. All right. So I feel like as someone who helps people share their stories, I could take this in a thousand different directions. But in terms of sharing my personal story, when I think about sharing my personal story, I immediately kind of go to my personal life as it relates to my work life. And so when I think about that, I kind of go back to my dream as a child, which was to work in advertising. And somewhere along the way, that did not happen. And I ended up working in insurance and I'm in the state of Connecticut. And for a very long time, the capital of Hartford was known as the insurance capital of the world. I think it's no longer that, but I think it's somewhat of a rite of passage, if you will, if you live in the state of Connecticut, that you somehow have to kind of make your way through uh, working in insurance at some point or another, which I I did, and it was fine. And I was a marketing manager at a insurance company, and I was exposed to just kind of all of the different amazing things that marketing entails and includes. And I, and this is probably when I was in my early 20s, and I absolutely loved my job. I loved what I did. However, as it relates to our conversation about graying rainbows, what happened is that I did not recognize at the time that it wasn't really cool to be out at work. And so I came into this environment just really kind of expecting to be able to be myself. And I was immediately discriminated against within just a couple of weeks of being on my job. And that was, you know, for about five and a half years or so that I stayed at that company. And that really, you know, in so many ways kind of led me to where I am today and all the different things that I've done over the last decade and a half. That's kind of, I guess, the the story that kind of pops into my head immediately when you say kind of share a little bit about your story. So at one point, I know you were the professional lesbian. So tell (laughs) us about that. Yes. So that actually stemmed out of my workplace experience. So I was working again at this insurance company. And instead of like, I'm kind of like a 
I like to take charge. I like to get things done. I'm very much known for just, if you need something, I got it covered. You don't need to know how it got done, but you know that I will get it done. And when I was at this job, I started to kind of do research to see what do companies do to support their LGBTQ employees? And I was like the company I was working for had like maybe a hundred employees. So it wasn't a big company by any means. I decided that I was going to take it upon myself to start some kind of LGBTQ marketing initiatives. And this was in 2004, 2005, 2006. And I was hell bent on creating change internally inside my workplace. And so I tried and I failed because the workplace culture that I was in was just having no part of being inclusive. And I've written four books around LGBTQ in the workplace and marketing and communications and stuff like that. I write a lot in much in in great detail kind of my experience in the workplace. But what ended up happening is that I finally got to that breaking point where I just couldn't reconcile what I was saying publicly about the company I worked for versus what was happening to me internally as an LGBTQ person. So I decided to leave my job without any safety net. And I did so in 2009. So like right during kind of all the the recession and the, the chaos that was happening. I decided that I would start consulting with companies, both big and small, on how to just do it right for LGBTQ people. And one day, you know, I was kind of jokingly telling somebody like, yeah, like I'm a professional lesbian for a living. This is what I'm doing. And the joking kind of just stuck. And every time I would say that, it would get people's attention. And so I decided, you know what, the hell with it. I'm just going to start to brand myself as the professional lesbian. So if you look up my name, that overpublishing, which is what I do now, um, that over and over again is the top things that come up in any search result is me as the professional lesbian. So before we talk about, I do want to talk about Publisher Purpose Press, but did you come out as a teenager or what was happened with you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I, you know, it's one of those interesting things and I haven't met too many people who share as similar of a story. But when I do, I feel like I found, a, you know, a kindred spirit. But if I go back in time, I can now see very clearly that in about fourth grade that I definitely, like I had a, a big crush on my fourth grade science teacher, for example. But I had no idea. I don't know if it was being a late bloomer. I really don't know. But I had like an aha moment one day when I was 19, where all of a sudden out of what felt like nowhere, it's like I could see my life in focus. And it was the revelation that like, wow, I am not attracted to boys. I'm actually attracted to girls. And it really just kind of hit me. And then once I had that revelation, it was like for the first time, I could see everything in really clear focus. And I was able to go back through history and be like, oh, that's what that feeling was toward that person. Or that was the lack of feeling toward this other person. And then I was able to really kind of date it back until about the fourth grade or so versus, you know, other people that I know, you know, I know so many people who just kind of knew when they were like five. I don't think I had the self-awareness as a child, but for some reason around 19, it all kind of hit me at once. And I've started asking people to put years on things just because everybody's experience is influenced by when it was. So Mm -hmm. what year was that when you were 19? 2000. Okay. Because at that point, probably young people were aware that one could be gay, right? Whereas like when I was a kid, it was very much hardly ever mentioned. Yeah, I think I I was kind of evolving as just the the recognition and the the media exposure was also evolving because I remember when Ellen came out in 1997. So this was still about four, you know, three or four years after that. To me, I definitely started seeing more LGBTQ characters, not that there was, you know, a saturation of them by any means, but definitely started to see that there are more gay characters portrayed on TV shows or in any number of other kind of cultural references. It's interesting. And I, I find those conversations interesting when I talk to people who are older or younger, because based on that decade that those pivotal moments are happening in, I think that plays a huge factor in the progression. What year was it when Willow fell in love with Tara? That would have been 2001? No, wait, they graduated in 98. So it would have been around that 99-ish time, right? 
Yeah, I was never into that, but I had uh, one of my first girlfriends was absolutely obsessed with that show. And yeah, it was definitely, I would say somewhere between 99 and 2001, like that was all the rage. And I think that was a really big pivotal piece in kind of um, the media portrayal of LGBTQ characters. So is there anything else about your story you, you want to talk about now before we talk about Publisher Purpose Press? Not necessarily. I feel like I there's I have never have a shortage of words, so I'm <laughs> I'm okay <laughs> moving on if you are. <laughs> okay. So we met last year because you had a booth at Creating Change for your company, Publish Your Purpose Press. And of course you helped me with my book, Are You Sure the Unconscious Origins of Certainty? So how did you come to start that company? So that was a, a number, a number of factors all kind of coming together. So one of the the biggest things was going back to that being, you know, not being allowed to be out at work at the insurance company I was working in. I just realized, and again, this was in, you know, 2006-ish is really when I started getting very involved in the LGBTQ space around marketing. In 2006, there just wasn't a lot out there as it related to best practices. Whereas now, you know, 14 years later, there's just so much information. But when I started it, there were only maybe a half a dozen other people or companies that were doing stuff in this space. I could see very clearly that a way to get myself more uh, more known in the space was to start writing books. And so I wrote my first one that I published in 2013. And I had already started a podcast back in 2012, which is now titled LGBTQ, Personal Branding for the LGBTQ Entrepreneur, I think is what it's called. I feel like I should know this, um, but it's something like that. I haven't recorded a new episode in a very, very long time. And I was writing two blog posts a week through all of 2012, 13, 14, and 15. So there's hundreds of blog posts there too. And what I realized is that, you know, some people don't want to have to hunt and peck and find the information that they're looking for on a website, even though it's there for free, they would rather just buy a book and have the shortcut version of it given to them. And so I wrote and published my first one in 2013 and it was called, But You Don't Look Gay. And it was really around successful marketing strategies for companies to be thinking about, which included phrases and things that you should not say, such as, <laughs> but you don't look gay. Right. As anyone listening to this podcast knows, there are so many offensive phrases that we probably hear on a pretty consistent basis that it's like, you know what? I've heard this so many times. I'm just going to, I'm just going to let it go because, you know, you got to pick your battles. I wrote the first one in 2013. Then I wrote another one in 2014, another in 2015. And then I switched my focus in 2016 to something else. And then wrote another LGBTQ one in 2017. So that was all kind of happening. And everyone I knew seemed to be asking me, how did you write your, how did you know how to write your book? Or how did you know how to hire an editor? Or how did you know how to hire a cover designer? It was all of these questions that I was getting on a really frequent basis that made me say, all right, what if I decided that I was going to teach people how to write their books and how to publish their books. Like, what would that look like? And so in the end of 2015, I set up like a beta test group to say, all right, I know all of you people and I love you. And you've asked me a hundred questions on how to do what I've done. Let's just get together in a group format and let's learn together. And I'm going to teach you exactly what I did. And so I ran the first group of that in early 2016. The first group had seven people in it. And interestingly enough, that on the day that we are recording this, one of the people who was in that very first group just published her book today, which is amazing. And I'm so proud of her. But as we can, you know, as you can see, that was in 2016 and now we are in 2020. So it took four years for her to kind of get, finally get everything together and get, you know, the mindset and all of the things to be able to get her book done. And so... I did that in 2016 and about halfway through the year, I had run a couple of these groups already. And I basically was telling people, I'm like, listen, I am making this up as I go. So if you trust me to provide and deliver what I said I'm going to provide and deliver, like I will give you your money back if you're not getting what I'm promising you. And I've never had anyone request for their money back. And 
what ended up happening, which is kind of the crazy part that I was not expecting because I was still doing my LGBTQ consulting at the time. And most of the people who were in that first group were LGBTQ people just because that's what who my network was before. And it's still very much heavily who my network is now. And I had a number of people say, okay, you just taught me over three months how to do this, but can I just pay you to do it instead? <laughs> and that kind of blew my mind. I don't know. I don't know why. Like I even think about it now. Like I don't, I really didn't expect it. Like I had, I really didn't think like this is the angle I was going for. I was thinking I'm going to create this program that's scalable, that kind of does its own thing. And then I can still be really involved when I want to be, but it's just going to kind of do its thing. And then all of a sudden it was August of 2016. And I had, it was like the third person to have asked me in the same week. And I was like, oh my God, I have to do something about this. And it was like, literally overnight where I was like, okay, I guess I now have a publishing company. And so that was a fun learning curve to figure out how to um, start, establish, and then run a publishing company. And the one thing that I really had absolutely no idea about was that with consulting, you have very high profit margins because you do all the work and, you know, there's not a huge amount of overhead because it's kind of like you're the one woman show and you kind of go out and do your own thing. But then when it came to the publishing aspect, I knew that if I was going to start a publishing company that really fulfilled the mission and vision that I was going for, that I had to have a really strong team behind me to execute that vision. And so that's when I learned very quickly that profitability in the publishing space is not that of consulting. And that was a very, uh, very interesting and hard lesson to learn. But that's kind of how it all came to be. It was very... It was very organic. It was very natural. And it just kind of like all kind of happened at once. And while this was all kind of like happening on my professional side of my life, I was also going through a whole series of personal challenges in my personal life that started well before 2016, but it was all kind of like boiling to a head during 2016. And I realized at that time that if I can be loud, if I don't mind being on a stage, if I can be the person who can help be the voice for other people, then it's almost like a responsibility and an obligation to be that voice for other people. So it was a combination of both of these things coming together that it made it a complete no-brainer to kind of muddle through all of the things in learning how to run a publishing company. For the sake of my listeners who don't know anything about publishing, you consider what you're doing hybrid publishing, is my understanding. Would you explain what that means? Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. So when you look at the publishing landscape, the two common options that everyone knows about typically, and that's traditional publishing and self-publishing. And so with traditional publishing, there's a lot of hurdles to get through to get a publisher to say, yes, I'm willing to take a chance on you, unknown author, and I'm going to, you know, when we're going to bring your book to market together. It's a whole industry with a lot of different kind of ways that they approach it. But at the end of the day, it's kind of a, a gamble. So they're gambling on an author that they feel is going to be, is going to sell a lot of books because they have to make money somehow because they're not charging you for it because it's a traditional publishing model. And then on the self-publishing side is an avenue that many people employ, which I am a huge proponent of, that if you follow best practices, you can self-publish an amazing book and no one would ever have any idea that it was self-published. But then there's this kind of like gray area in the middle where someone might not have access to a traditional publisher because, you know, their topic isn't interesting enough to a traditional publisher or they don't have a big enough audience for a traditional publisher or any, you know, any of those types of variables. But they also have no interest or desire in learning how to self-publish it and go through the headache and hassle and the learning curve, which is pretty steep on that side, to getting it done. So that's where hybrid publishing comes in. And it's really what it sounds like. It's a hybrid of both of these options where you really are getting the value, the service, the expertise 
of a traditional publishing house, of, of a team of people who know what they're doing, that are going to help you bring the best book to market that you can, but you're paying in alignment more so of what you would expect if you were self-publishing. The benefit is that you don't have the learning curve and you don't have to project manage the whole thing by yourself. So we are one of many, 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 many hybrid publishers out there. And it's been for the last, I'd say about five years or so, the fastest growing section of the publishing industry because authors are just starting to see that, you know, the traditional publishing route doesn't always make the most sense for them or self-publishing doesn't make sense for them. So they want to have control over a lot of the variables that they want to, you know, they want to be able to, to, you know, just produce a really good quality book. So, you know, they end up paying for those services and that's, you know, something that, that we offer. And like I said, there's many, many others that are, are, you know, similar in terms of the model, not necessarily similar in regards to the approach. How did you choose the name Publish Your Purpose Press? Oh, that's a fun story. So I originally had named this company Purpose Driven Publishing because for me, it's really about purpose being at the core of why you're writing this book. And so the way that we focus and the way that we operate, we're really focused on kind of the strategic pieces of, you know, how is a book going to help you fill your purpose? So that could be it's fulfilling your purpose as a public speaker. It could be as a podcaster. It could be as a business owner. There's so many different variables as it relates to that. But purpose is at the the front of all of it. I started off by calling it Purpose Driven Publishing. And then I want to say it was maybe three months in, I got a cease and desist from Rick Warren, the author of The Purpose Driven Life. And that book, just as a fun fact, sells second to the Bible of books ever sold of all book history is The Purpose Driven Life is the second. And so obviously there's a lot a lot of... Um, money and clout to that. And so I was not about to fight that. It'd be like fighting Disney. (laughs) Correct. Uh, So I was like, okay, obviously I did not do my homework. And I knew that that was out there, but I didn't realize that I was violating the copyright so heavily. And so I rebranded over literally over a weekend. I had no choice. And I came up with Publisher Purpose Press because we had been using the phrase Publisher Purpose already. And I was like, oh, I'm just going to use that. And it was a friend of mine who happened to point it out of like, um, duh, the answer is right in front of you. Because I kind of panicked thinking like, oh, Lord, I got to come up with a, I got to come up with a different name really quickly. But the crux of it is really because it's just, it's focused around purpose. Because I think if we have purpose in life, we have our mission, our values, we want to create impact and make change in the world, that we have to have a strong purpose as the foundation for all of that. So if somebody comes to you, do you have some sort of screening criteria that you would use before you accept a client? Yeah. And right now that screening criteria is still me and having a personal conversation. I feel really strongly that if we're going to publish something or if I'm going to work with anyone in any capacity that I have to believe in them as a person and I have to believe in their topic. And if I feel like one of those is out of alignment, I have a number of different publishing partners that I can make very strong referrals to, to say, you know, for whatever reason, you know, I I don't think this is going to be the right fit for us, but I want to make sure that even if I'm not a right fit, that to the person that I'm referring to someone else, that they're still going to have a good experience, even if it's not, you know, a right fit for me. I want to make sure they don't get taken advantage of in this industry that is notorious for being very predatory to first-time authors. So right now, it's still the vetting process is still a conversation with me. And then, you know, if we kind of get through that first phone call where where we recognize like, okay, we're in good shape. Send me your manuscript. I'll take a look at it. I'll have my editorial team take a look at it. And then we kind of go from there. So it's very organic, even though we serve, you know, we work with a lot of authors, but for now and for as long as I can still be involved in making that decision at the top, that that's my personal goal. Okay. So let's back up, Jen, to the person who says, well, I've got a story because I know your your tagline is Everyone has a story, right? But they have no idea how to get started. That is a beautiful question. And I have a resource that anyone can have access to. But 
it's really, and I get the, I get asked this question all the time of like, how do I get started? And it's really hard. And I'm not going to like, I, I don't, I don't lie. Like I don't sugarcoat things like writing a book is really, really difficult. But again, if you can have the purpose of why you're doing it at the forefront of that decision, all of the ups and downs, the emotional turmoil, all of the things that inevitably come from writing your book, you're able to kind of anchor back in to that higher purpose for what you're doing. So in terms of getting started, I actually have a program that I call Getting Started for Authors, and it's on our website. There's a button right at the top uh, right-hand corner that's the Getting Started for Authors course. And it's a completely free program, but the purpose of it is to just give that foundational information to say, all right, you want to know how to get started. Here's the first thing that you should do. Here's the second thing you should do. And it actually walks you through. So my goal with that is that by the end of going through that program, and it's about maybe three or four hours of content broken up into a bunch of different sessions, but the goal is that you can then get your book written. You don't have to hire me personally to help you with it. You can go and just kind of get that done on your own. And so I created that actually pretty recently in the beginning of 2020, just to kind of be of service to people that, you know, maybe they don't have a budget that can afford a writing coach or a publishing coach, or even if they can't afford to purchase a book about this, at least they have access to the information to help them get in the right direction. But I would say try to nail down your purpose first and foremost of why are you doing this? And then once you have that clear answer of, okay, this is why I'm doing it, ask yourself why again. Okay, I said it's this reason. Now, why is it this reason? And just keep going deeper and deeper until you want to bang your head against a wall because that's going to be the core of why you're really doing it. And once you know that... All the other things are learnable, right? Like there's nothing, there's nothing proprietary. There's nothing earth shattering. There's free information everywhere about the mechanics of the how of the writing, but it really just kind of comes down to knowing why you're doing it to begin with, because everything else will be a lot smoother once you have that figured out. I'm going to break in for just a moment to ask you to consider buying the second edition of my book, Are You Sure?, The Unconscious Origins of Certainty. Although the book is based on several early episodes of my podcast, Brain Science, you need no background or interest in neuroscience to enjoy it. My goal is to explain how scientists know that most of what our brain does is outside our conscious awareness and control. But more importantly, I share why this matters. You can buy Are You Sure? from your favorite online bookstore, but I will also include a link in the show notes. There's free information everywhere about the mechanics of the how of the writing, but it really just kind of comes down to knowing why you're doing it to begin with, because everything else will be a lot smoother once you have that figured out. I think that's really good advice. I can really relate to how true that is based on my own experience. So really, when you're when you're working with people with Publisher Purpose Press, there's a lot of different levels. A person can use your free resources and then just go from there, or they can go to the higher levels of, of involvement. And you have group courses, too, for people who maybe can't afford the private coaching but feel like they need some coaching. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. So my personal mission when it comes to publishing is to make it accessible for as many people as it can be. Because in general, the publishing industry is just so unaccessible for so many people and people make it really hard and complicated for their own personal gain because they want to make it complicated because they want to complicate it so much that you as the potential author have no choice but to have to hire that company to help you. And so that's why I have so many free resources. I just happened to mention one of them, but I have probably hundreds of different resources at this point, because to me, I want to be of service. I want to help people not get taken advantage of, to not get screwed over by this industry that's just notorious for it. I have a lot of information that I do hear from people where they say, hey, I I downloaded whatever this thing is and I was able to get my book done because I followed your directions. And it's like, you know what? To me, that's fulfilling my goal. It doesn't have to be like, I don't have to have a monetary gain for me to count that as a victory and a success for me personally that I helped someone get it done. Like however they get it done, like 
go you, you got it done. However, I do know for a lot of people that going it alone is just not an option. In those instances, like you said, I have, I work with people one-on-one, which you and I do, which I absolutely love. And then I have group programs, which is called our PYP Academy. And so that's usually four to six people and it's over 14 weeks. And I am there kind of as people Sherpa, there's 14 weeks of content that go with it as well. So there's worksheets and videos and lessons. And then there's a lot of brainstorming to help get the whole process done. And then, of course, if someone already has a manuscript written and completed, then once we're at that point, you know, they can just kind of jump right into our publishing track. Just really kind of depends on where people are at. But my personal mission is to just really help protect people because this industry is just so terrible on that front that, you know, if I can prevent any of your listeners from having some bad experience, like that is ultimately my end goal. Like for me, I realized that even though, you know, a lot of other forms of media are now popular, there's still no substitute for a book. Yeah. And I don't know that that's ever going to change because I think you could have, you know, I know that you've been podcasting for well over a decade at this point. And I also know that you've written books. And I really think that for someone who is putting their thought leadership out there, whether it's in the form of a podcast or a blog, like you said, there really is no substitution for a book because even, you know, if you're someone who's an aspiring speaker, there are very big differences between speakers getting paid who have books versus those that don't have books. And same thing if you consult or you're selling some kind of service, if you have a book and your competition doesn't, you're going to likely get the business over the competition Competition, again, of you know, if all things are equal, I have to put that caveat out there. But if all things are equal and you have a book and your competition doesn't, there's a higher likelihood that you're going to get that business versus your versus your competitor. And you're probably going to get paid more because you are known, like you're a known thought leader and an expert on that topic. I want to talk a little bit about some of the personal storytelling kinds of books. You know, the ones that people write because not because they're going to make money or get a speaking gig or any of that stuff, but just because they've got a story that needs to be shared. And I know Publisher Purpose Press is its share of books in that category. Can you talk a little bit about that? Maybe pick somebody out that stands out in your mind as, as a, a good example storytelling is so important. And as you said before, one of the taglines that we use a lot is everyone has a story. And I really, really believe that. Oftentimes, what happens is that as an author or an aspiring author or just someone who has a story that they want to share it in whatever medium that might look like, we have this false belief that our story isn't worth sharing. We're not worthy enough. There's a little bit of an imposter syndrome kind of mixed into it, or we're looking at what other people are publishing or what people are releasing as bestsellers. And we're kind of like, "Mm, you know, my, my story wouldn't reach that big of an audience. So if you're thinking, why would I only publish this book if it's going to sell a thousand copies? Your book doesn't have to be a New York Times bestseller. It could easily be that your intended and target audience is maybe only a thousand people worldwide, but that shouldn't be the limitation that you put on yourself and your story because there's still those thousand people that you could dramatically impact the quality of their life by them hearing your story and what you've gone through. And I can even use my own book as an example, my memoir that is releasing as we speak. There's a lot of books around mental health, a lot of them. And there's a lot of books that are around suicide or depression or high anxiety or even autism spectrum. Like there's just a lot of stuff like kind of all in that realm. But there are a lot of mental health disorders that are very, very... I don't want to say niche, but they impact or affect a much, much, much smaller percentage of people. And I think sometimes people just assume, well, you know, this, you know, this thing that I'm struggling with or I'm talking about only affects like 5% of people. Why would I want to go through the headache and hassle of getting the story out there? But what I think we have to remember 
is that there's still that 5% of people that are being impacted by whatever that is, and they're not feeling seen or heard or represented in any format currently. So your book could be that thing that kind of comes in and helps them feel seen and heard potentially for the first time. And so with my book, it's called House on Fire. It is both a literal house fire that I had when I was 18, but it's more of the figurative house on fire of growing up in a home with a mentally, um, a sister with severe mental health needs to then fast forwarding to raising her daughter later in life, also with severe mental health needs. And that particular diagnosis is called reactive attachment disorder. And it impacts less than 5% of kids worldwide. That is one of the main things themes of my memoir. While yes, there are there are tons of universal truths to my memoir. Obviously, I talk about coming out because it's a huge part of who I am. The intended recipient of that book, in my opinion, is for people who are orbiting the world of someone who is struggling with raising a child who happens to have reactive attachment disorder. Because oftentimes you feel alone, people don't believe what you're saying, you start to question your own sanity. While yes, it affects less than 5% of the population, there's 5% of our population that is struggling really, really deeply and they need this outside voice, which in this case just happens to be mine, to be able to give that book to a friend, to a family member to say, listen, I'm not making this up. This is my reality. And I think a lot of times as authors, we're not really thinking about it on that granular of a level because society is telling us that if you're going to publish a book, it has to be a New York Times bestseller. It has to sell a million copies. That's not the case. You know, your audience could be a very, very narrow audience. You know, my goal is if, you know, if I help save the sanity of anyone who might be struggling in this situation and provide one more resource for someone to be able to give to a family member to say, listen, this isn't just me. Like, this is an actual thing. Like, here someone else wrote about it. I think that that's kind of what it's all about. So I think that going back to your question about, you know, getting started and I was talking about purpose, also be thinking about that. Like, who do you want to be impacted by this? And if that number is a very, very small group of people, say, you know, say it's something that only impacts a thousand people worldwide, who cares? You know, because if it's something that you're struggling with, other people are struggling with it too. And that should be one of the guiding principles forward as to why this is worth all of the headache and hassle. When you look at the books that you have published so far with Publish Your Purpose Press, is there one that maybe stands out for you as a good example. I know you, we're, we'll talk some more about your book. It's a great example, but I was thinking maybe it, somebody else's story might stand mm-hmm. out in your mind that you could might share. I have a couple of favorites. I often don't share them in public forums, but there's one book of ours that I happen to be quite fond of that we published in 2017. So it was one of our first books. Our first book came out in April of 2017. And this one came out in November of 2017. So one of our very, very first. And it's called Cracked Open, Never Broken. And it's the story of Iman Getty, who is an author and a grief recovery counselor who is based in Canada. And her story is such a tragedy to triumph type of story where she talks about the murder of her mother when she was six years old by her father and essentially becoming orphaned at age six and then bouncing kind of through a very disruptive Canadian foster care system through much of her early life. When I first talked to her, I can still remember so clearly where I was I can remember every detail because her story was just so impactful. It was so important to her that her story not be sensationalized because there are so many details to the story. And I'm I'm very intentionally kind of just being vague on it because I don't want to sensationalize what actually happened. It was such an important thing for her to make sure that that's not how it came across, but she needed to share her story to show and to provide kind of that path and the illumination for other people who may have had something similar happen to them, or even if it's not similar, but to just kind of suddenly be orphaned so quickly and so young to just show them that there's a a path forward. 
And she is one of the most beautiful humans that I swear walks this earth in terms of her just immense caring and compassion and empathy for anyone who's recovering from any type of grief. So I feel like she's such a great example of how we can take our personal life experiences and we can transform ourselves by just kind of healing and working through whatever that stuff is. But then we also are now experts on that tragedy that brought us to that place to begin with on that healing, how to be more empathetic, and then to be able to just impact and create change for so many people that I, I find that hers to be such such a great example because on the surface, like there's a lot of universal truths to what she writes about. But at the end of the day, she's speaking to, I think, a very, very specific type of audience. And as an author, it was so important to her that she's not just written about and her book isn't marketed as a sensationalized headline, which is so often the case because people, you know, publishers want book sales. And so for us, we were very intentional about how everything was was approached to make sure that we were honoring that truth that she wanted to make sure was honored. That's a great example. And I really like the way that you emphasize the idea that you could come through a bad situation and you don't have to spend your life seeing yourself as a victim. Yeah. And that's so important for her to not ever be viewed as a victim. And I I totally understand it. I fully understand where she's coming from. You know, if someone's listening to this and they have some kind of really rough or tragic experience in their past, there's ways to approach it to be empowering. And at the end of the day, if you want to make meaning out of something that felt meaningless, the best way to do that is to share your story and to help show other people that like, yes, there is an after this particular experience, because I think a lot of people kind of get stuck in that and then they end up feeling like a victim and then it just kind of impacts in a lot of different other areas of their life. Yeah. One of the things I've learned from talking to my guests on this show is when people share their story, even in the context of a podcast, they'll say, if it helps one person, it's worth it. Mm hmm. And I think that that is such a beautiful guiding light for anyone who's thinking about publishing their book. Because if you think about your story, there is inevitably at least one person whose life could be transformed as a result of hearing your story. And if that's all you need to do is just write for that one person, then more power to you because someone needs to hear what you have to say. So is there anything else you want to share, Jen? I can't think of anything similar to when you were asking about my personal story. Again, I could go in a hundred different directions, but I will refrain. <laughs> okay. So what's the name of your new book? House on Fire. And it's available everywhere? The usual book buying places? It sure is. Yes. So the name of the book is House on Fire, Finding Resilient Hope and Purpose in the Ashes. So it's available wherever you can buy a book, but I would definitely make sure you put in some iteration of the subtitle or my name, just because there's a lot of books that also are called House on Fire, but most of those are fiction. And this is a memoir. And that's your eighth? This is number six, but I did just start number seven last week. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like a disease or a compulsion of some sort. Well, they say that people write because they have to. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. I definitely feel, I feel that, I don't know what it is. Like every time, once I'm done with one, it's just, it really is a compulsion where it's like, okay, I have, now I have to, I have to get to this next one that I've been putting on the back burner till this one was done. Okay. So that brings up the one thing that I know we shouldn't leave out. And that is once you finish writing a book and it's out the door, that's not the end. Oh no, 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 no. <laughs> That is the beginning. And I think that that is one of those things that when you realize that, that you, all of this work that you have done, that you are just at the starting line, I think can actually stress people out quite a bit. And the analogy I would give is like thinking about training for any type of event. So I ran a marathon and I've run tons of half marathons, but I ran one marathon. It's going to be my first and only. 
as far as I'm concerned at this current moment. But if I think about all of the training that I put into training for the marathon, that once you get to that training run, you're like, oh yeah, you know, I was able to run 26 miles. Like race day should be, I should be able to do this. Like I have all the skills I've trained. I'm, I'm ready to roll. I know how to fuel all of those things. It's the same thing with a book, like the writing of the book and the production of the book. That's all of the training, but you still have to stand on that starting line and now have to complete that actual final race, which is the marketing and telling people that your book exists. And I think that that is the one thing that I have seen over and over and over again is the hesitancy and the reluctance of marketing. We even had authors that we worked with. It was a a co-author pair and they just fundamentally hated the word marketing. And so when we were having conversations about their book, we would call it lighting fire because that was something that felt better to them about like, how do we light fire and spark beneath this book to get it into the hands of the readers who need to hear it? And I think a lot of authors are just, you know, either not naturally good self-promoters, which is the case with, I would say, the majority of people. But that really is kind of the starting line is, okay, now you have the book done. Now the hard part starts, which is getting people to know it exists and then to purchase it. I'm struggling with that part right now, I'll admit. (laughs) As you know, as you know, (laughs) (laughs) as you know. (laughs) Okay, well, I have really enjoyed this conversation. I've got so many listeners with stories that are worth sharing and they may not necessarily ever want to come on the podcast to share their story, but maybe they might want to share it in the writing form. And then I've had guests that I think their stories would make books. So I hope that this will help a lot of people and make them aware that this this hybrid model, which I don't think I would have been aware existed if we hadn't met, I'm glad to be able to share that with others. Yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity to share my story. And I think any any opportunity is a good one. So I appreciate that. Thank you. I want to thank Jen T. Grace for taking the time to talk with me. But I also want to thank her for helping make the second edition of Are You Sure? The Unconscious Origins of Certainty, a book that I feel proud to share with others. If you have any interest in writing, I highly recommend Publish Your Purpose Press. As she mentioned, her website includes many free resources along with a wide variety of other services. Also, don't forget to check out her new book, House on Fire, Finding Resilience, Hope, and Purpose in the Ashes. As always, you'll find links to all these things in the show notes on my website at grainrainbows.com. While you're there, please sign up for the free newsletter so that you can get show notes every month automatically. You can send me feedback at grainrainbows at gmail.com or submit voice feedback at speakpipe.com forward slash Doc Artemis or post to the Grain Rainbows fan page on Facebook. Now, For those of you who want some privacy and support, we've moved our Facebook group to MeWe for better privacy. In order to join, you need an invitation, so just email me if you want an invitation. Also, if you're already a member, you can invite new members. And don't forget to subscribe to Grain Rainbows in your favorite podcasting app. It's free. Finally, if you are able please consider supporting Grain Rainbows financially via Patreon at patreon.com forward slash graying rainbows. Graying spelled with an A. The main expense that you're helping to defer is audio editing. You can choose whatever amount fits your budget and every little bit helps. I'll be back on the first Friday of August with the next episode of Grain Rainbows. Don't forget, I'm always looking for people who are willing to share their story, whether via email or on the show. In the meantime, please check out my other podcasts, Books and Ideas, and Brain Science. Thanks again for listening. I look forward to talking with you again very soon. Grain Rainbows is copyright 
2020 to Virginia Campbell, MD. You may copy it to share it with others, but for any other uses or derivatives, please contact me at grainrainbows at gmail.com.